Well, good morning, church. Uh, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Ben. I am the director of student ministries here at the refinery, and it is my privilege to be able to speak to you uh, this morning as we continue in this uh, unboxed uh, Finding Joy series as we uh, look at um, Advent leading up to Christmas. And the idea behind this uh, series title, Unboxed, comes kind of from what we've uh, made at Christmas. It has a lot to do with gifts, which often come in boxes. And the Davis boys in that video uh, that was just played, they did a really good job demonstrating uh, what a lot of people out there in the, this YouTube document and post everything world that we live in uh, called unboxing. So they're unboxing packages. And if you're not familiar with unboxing, uh, when you go home or you can get out your phone right now and Google it, um, search like iPhone unboxing or something like that. And you'll find videos that catalog in real time someone opening up a package and telling you what's inside. It's thrilling, right? <laughs> I don't really get it, uh, but I guess it's nice to know kind of what to expect, maybe. Um, or maybe there's like a special way that you need to open the box so that all the stuff doesn't come spilling out. Um, and I actually just looked up some videos, some unboxing videos, and I saw one. It was posted on Monday, on December uh, 10th. It was about unboxing a Mac Pro and a Pro Display. And three days later, on December 13th, that video, which, by the way, was 19 minutes long, <laughs> had 1.1 million views. 19 minutes about opening up a box. <laughs> I know. If I've got 19 minutes to spare, right, I know what I'm not going to do is watch someone open up their computer. But, <laughs> but that's what it is. That's what uh, unboxing is. There's a fascination with gifts uh, and the thrill of like opening up a box. And we've made Christmas into this exchange of gifts, which really does have some good meaning to it. But there's so much anticipation for what's inside and this love for things that tends to overshadow the joy that the birth of Christ brought to our world. So that's why we framed it this way, unboxing joy. Because unboxing something comes with anticipation and with hope. But what would it really look like for you to unbox joy this season? To receive it, to accept it, to understand the joy of a life lived for Jesus? Would it take away all the pain and discomfort in your life? I don't think so. But what would it really look like to unbox joy this season? What if joy could help combat fear, anxiety, and our own selfish expectations? Today I'd like to look at um, Mary, Jesus' mother, because she had a unique connection and perspective. So we're going to be in the uh, book of Luke. So if you've got your Bible, you can uh, flip to the beginning of Luke. If you've got your phone, go ahead and uh, head over to Luke. And over the past uh, couple weeks, I've really uh, liked hearing from uh, Sean, who reflected on the promise of the coming Jesus, and from Eric last week, who led us as we looked at the arrival of John the Baptist, who paved the way for Jesus through some amazing circumstances uh, in the life of Zechariah and Sarah. And I want to focus on this today. How can we combat fear or anxiety or confusion, things that Mary must have felt, with joy? How can we combat fear with joy? And I want you to think about this. What fears or uncertainties or even unworthiness in your life prevents you from joy? Or what great hope do you have that requires tremendous faith like Mary's. And looking uh, to Christmas and in my past, when I was little, I was all in on Santa. I loved it. I knew that if you weren't asleep, or at least out of sight, that when Santa came, you get nothing. So I want to set this up for you. It was Christmas Eve. Uh, I was probably in first grade. Uh, my brothers and my sister and I were all sleeping in the same bedroom for that night because it was kind of fun to all be together on Christmas Eve like that. 
and we're finally winding down, uh, getting settled in to go to sleep. But I, at this point, probably already had like three cups of hot chocolate, and I had to go. <laughs> All that liquid, just waiting there. But it was already late. What if Santa was out there? What if, as I'm walking down the hall to the bathroom, I run into the big man? So I'm like considering my options right now. Do I risk offending Santa and ruining Christmas, or do I find a way to relieve myself in the bedroom? <laughs> so I look around, I'm frantic, right, worried I'm going to lose it, and I see my baby brother's bag of diapers. <laughs> Perfect, right? So I suit up, take care of business, and thanks to my quick thinking, Christmas is saved that year. <laughs> I didn't disturb Santa. <laughs> but, but we've built in. The, that's a true story, by the way. <laughs> as much as it humiliates me to say that. <laughs> but, but we've built these traditions, right, about like Santa, a lot of them uh, pretty innocent and fun into Christmas. Uh, and I think it's partly an attempt at joy. Whether it's Santa's magic, uh, tons of gifts, a perfect Christmas tree, because that's, that's for me now what I really like. Back then it was Santa. Now it's the Christmas tree. I really enjoy it. I grew up working on a Christmas tree farm. So we'd trim the trees in the summer, and I'd help uh, sell them around Christmas. So I've always had a real tree. But these days, a real nice tree costs some real money. And I'm a bit on the frugal side. So I shop the 1999 section at Straters because they send that ad out, right? It's like starting from 1999, you can get a real Christmas tree. So I go, um, scout through the section, and, and for 20 bucks, um, looking for a tall tree, you're gonna get it with some, uh, with some like, yeah, you're, you, the $20 tree you're gonna find is gonna be sketchy, right? It's gonna have some some serious trade-offs. And so that's what I that's what I did last year. Um, got one of these that um, that kind of looked like it had a big old pot belly, right? Asymmetrical on one side, um, and I paid the price for it last year. I was away one weekend after I'd set this thing up and decorated it, uh, and it tipped over while Cynthia and the boys were home. I was gone, so it spilled water all over the ground. Uh, a few ornaments shattered, including one that had my son Miles's face on it, and like. So it shatters, and he sees it, and Cynthia says he screams, like, my Christmas is broken. <laughs> right, it ruined it for him. So I, I just tell you that to say that I'm not immune uh, to, you know, all the fun things that come uh, around Christmas. Um, I think we do these things because they're fun, because they make us happy. And I think we do these things um, sometimes out of obligation. But I also think that for many of us, there's a lot of fear in our lives fear of maybe not being good enough, or of disappointing somebody, or fear of what others might think about us, or fear of what's to come, right, like the unknown. So when I consider Mary, the mother of Jesus, it's easy to look at it from where we are now in history, looking back, all that we now know, all that would happen after Jesus comes in the manger. But Mary didn't have the perspective that we do now. She was living in those moments. But what she did have was trust, a faith that was built on trust. That's what I want to look at, because it's an area that I want to continue to grow in. Maybe you do too, faith built on trust. So in Luke, uh, which is one of the gospels that uh, describes Jesus' birth, it says this, starting in uh, chapter one, Verse 26, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. So he sends this word to Mary, who is not a prophet, who is not a priest, like Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. Mary is a young Jewish woman, living at home, probably at this point, planning her wedding. 
and God brings disannouncement into her life. In verse 29, it says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. So here's this young girl, not worthy in the same way that Zechariah the priest was worthy. She's not trained in religion. And she's confused, wondering why God would use someone unworthy like her. God goes on to tell Mary through Gabriel in verses uh, 31 and 33. You will receive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary responds in Luke, first chapter, verse 34, How will this be, since I'm a virgin? Last week, Eric described Zechariah's response to an angel telling him that he and his wife would have a baby in their old age. And his response was, how can I be sure of this? I think he had some doubt about it. But here, Mary's response seems to show she's simply wondering how she's going to play a part. She's not yet married. She hasn't been with her fiancé yet. I think she's curious. And Mary would have known, having been raised in a Jewish family, what the prophecies were. The prophecy to King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 16, that says, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever because of before me. Your throne will be established forever. So I think Mary likely would have known what the angel was referring to, that he meant the Son of God. In Mary's response, how will this be? She knows she's not already pregnant. She knows she'll likely be engaged for like a year before she gets married. So she's wondering how this is going to unfold. And I think she understands that the angel's describing a miraculous birth. And Gabriel tells her, the Holy Spirit will accomplish this. This will be the Son of God. And he reminds her that just as her relative Elizabeth had a baby in her old age, that no word from God will ever fail. And Mary's answer in that instant, in Luke 138, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me according to your word. What an amazing reaction from Mary. She hasn't discussed this with anybody yet, right? She hasn't gotten together with people to, to go over it. I'd be like, all right, give me a minute, Gabe. I need to talk to somebody. Right? Probably a lot of people before I'm good with this plan. In the laws in the Torah, right, the Old Testament law that governed Mary's culture, um, for her to be engaged and not married and presumably a virgin, but to be pregnant would have meant that she could be stoned. She could be killed. We find out later that Joseph decides he's going to choose a different option and he's going to look at annulling the upcoming marriage, which would probably still have publicly made uh, Mary look pretty undesirable in the culture. So she's risking some major personal and social parts of her life. And her answer, her willingness to allow God to work through her life is incredible. So we know Mary was at first troubled by Gabriel's words. And I've got to think that despite her response, there must have been some fear about what was to come, at least fear of the unknown. But what's so amazing, and something that I want to grow in, is how she has this incredible trust. So what is it that allows her to trust God like this? Could I trust God with something as big as this? Could you? What would your reaction be? But I think there's something about Mary's servanthood that helped her overcome fear. See, she already had a faith rooted in who God was. She knew that his words would not fail. Her willingness to be a servant 
required the trust in God that she already had. She had this baseline of faith. And that, I think, allowed her to deal with the fear or anxiety that might have prevented someone from being obedient. So she has a true trust in God, not a faith in some doctrine alone. So it makes me wonder, in my life, what is God asking me to do? What is he blessing me with? And what's my reaction? See, Mary was able to combat fear with joy. So what are the fears that creep in and discourage joy? And how do we accept the things that we don't have control over? We see Mary, and it's easy to think, of course she trusted God, right? She was going to be the mother of the Son of God. Her kid would be the greatest person to ever walk the earth, right? You think your toddler is cute, right? Imagine rolling up like, Son of God back there, no big deal, right? There had to be this, like, anticipation, my goodness, I get to be that? I mean, and my boys are, my boys are pretty cute, they're pretty good kids, um, but still, some things come out of their, their mouths sometimes, and I'm like, come on, kid, like, why would you say that, right? Or I look back, and he's, like, dining on boogers in the back seat, and it's not pleasant. But Mary was going to be the mother of Jesus, right? This amazing man. But Mary didn't know everything that we do about Jesus, She didn't get to know the names of the countless people who sit with the Father in heaven because of the life, death, and resurrection of her son. In that instant, Gabriel is telling her about becoming the mother of Jesus. But Mary doesn't get to know, in that instant, that her son will be the savior of generations and generations of people, including many of us here in this room. She couldn't know that. But what she did get to experience was constantly wondering what heartbreak was coming. Because in Luke chapter 2, we read about Mary and Joseph taking their infant son Jesus to the temple for the purification rites that they would have needed to do um, according to their customs. And while they're there, it says a righteous man, Simeon, who had assurance from God that he'd get to see the Messiah, he speaks over Jesus and blesses their family. And then he turns directly to Mary in Luke chapter 2, verse 34. And he says to her, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. A sword will pierce your soul, Mary. At first, when Simeon is telling her, it all seems like pretty good news, right? He's confirming what Gabriel had already shared about who Jesus was. But then he says, and a sword will pierce your heart. Basically saying, major heartbreak is coming your way, Mary. And there was a lot of heartbreak in Mary's life related to her son, Jesus. A lot of instances throughout her life where she could have thought, well, that must have been the heartbreak that Simeon was talking about. For example, the fact that Mary was poor, and we know that she was poor because um, we learn that she offered doves uh, when Jesus was dedicated as an infant instead of a lamb, which is what normally would have been required. But a lamb is expensive, so you were allowed to bring doves if you couldn't afford a lamb. So it was likely that she was poor couldn't provide for her kid all the best things like any mother would want to do. Or maybe the heartbreak that came from the rejection and disappointment that Mary would have experienced from her family because her son, the supposed son of God, spent all his time with the people with the worst reputations. Lepers, tax collectors, sinners that nobody else wanted to be near. That's who her little, little boy had grown up to be. Instead of being a proud of a son who had great friends, she probably felt like she had to defend his reputation. Or the heartbreak that she felt because the most important religious leaders who she probably wanted to impress 
were plotting to humiliate and murder her son. This boy she cared for was the target of ridicule, and he was being chased down to kill. And then finally, when she's standing at the foot of the cross, watching her son tortured, this man she cared for, this miraculous baby, this child she loved, she watches him die. And then I think she understands Simeon's words as the sword cuts through Jesus' side. She experiences a different hurt and pain and fear. But she didn't know all these things when she heard that message from Gabriel, that she would become pregnant and give birth to Jesus. We know them now because we can look back on her life. But she trusted God at his word and moved on from there. And here's what I know, that pain is a part of our life, and fear often comes with it. I know that some of you here have experienced great pain in life, and my guess is that many of you have. A lot of you here are older than me, and a lot younger, too. But I bet most of you know what it's like to love someone so much that you want something better for them. To see someone hurt or hurting themselves and nothing you say or do can fix them. And that's where I imagine Mary was at the cross, wanting to take the pain and ridicule herself, as most parents would for their children. So why do I believe that we can combat fear with joy? And why do I think that joy is possible, even through pain? Because the people I love are far better off according to his plans than mine. And even though I don't believe that it's God's plan to hurt us and add pain, the fact is that sin and hurt are a part of our lives. So when I was uh, five years old, uh, some major pain entered my life and my family's life. I've mentioned it before, but I didn't share a lot about it. Um, but when, when I was five, um, so my older brother, Matt, who some of you might know, uh, attends here. He would have been around seven or eight. Uh, my youngest brother was one year old, and there's a sister between us. And my mother got sick. She was tired at home and not feeling well. And she went to the hospital and died there within a week. It was cancer. It was quick and really hard for our family. And I've got two kids of my own now about the same age my mom was when she died. And I cannot imagine the pain that my dad and the rest of my family went through when his wife and the mother of his four kids was gone, just like that. I tell you about this really just to say that, that I understand pain. I understand the desire to want to do things a different way, a way that's easier, a way that doesn't have to bring that much pain and fear. And I don't know what's to come, but I know the feeling of wondering what if. What if she didn't get sick? What if she didn't die? What if she got to meet her grandchildren? And I bet Mary wondered, what if? What if God hadn't chosen me? What if I'd gotten to live the life I'd imagined? a life without the pain of raising a son who'd bring such personal heartbreak. But we know all that happened in Mary's life and through Jesus. We know the hope that's offered to the world through him. She had to have such amazing trust at the beginning. And I don't have all the answers right, about my mother's death. I don't know why other than that pain is part of our world. We all get to experience that. But I tell you this, my family and I personally got to experience how awesome the church is through this. I saw a church encourage my family and support my family and love my family through that pain. And that for me was like getting to see a little bit of the way God loves us all of us. I gained that perspective about the amazing love of God through people. 
And I learned something else about people too. That they shield you from certain things. Even if you don't want them to. For example, after my mom passed, I missed out on some special things. Like the advice a mom might give about dating a girl. Or the mother-son dance at my wedding. But one of the things that I feel really deprived of was this. One of those things I wish had been part of my life because it seemed like so much fun as I watched it in my friends' lives. But because it was a sensitive topic and my friends didn't know how I would react, they never made, to me, any yo mama jokes. (laughs) And I feel like I missed out on that, you know? I grew up in the late 80s and early 90s. That was the height of yo mama jokes. But nope, they probably thought, poor little Ben, right? Too fragile to handle that. (laughs) And it's funny funny to think about, uh, but it's for sure true that we're often wondering what if. If Mary, the mother of Jesus, could have had things go her way, I'm sure she would have saved her boy from death on the cross. But Mary trusted a God who can do immeasurably more, as Paul writes in Ephesians, than we can ask or imagine. And through belief and trust in Jesus, we too can have his power work within us. So I want to leave you with a few questions to think about. What don't you trust God with? What do you think he can't accomplish or save? A friend's life, a son or a daughter, or your own life? And what do you hope for? What amazing, incredible things do you hope that require unwavering trust in God? Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And sometimes uh, the enemy of joy is comparison. Mary must have had expectations for what her son would be like, for the kind of king that he would become. But if God was limited to Mary's human dreams for Jesus, the story plays out way differently. We learn about a mother who trusted that God would fulfill his promises, despite the personal hurt that it brought to her. And I think that's why it was so important for Luke, who wrote this gospel that his name is attached to, to start off his book that we've been looking at the way he does. In Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So that you may know that God is true to his word. So that you may know that Jesus is worth embracing with your life. And that this man Jesus, born from a virgin mother who was young and fearful, but accepted the path that God had for her. Not because she had earned some worthiness, and not because she was without sin, but because she was a servant. She trusted her God, and I urge you to do the same. Not because acceptance is a good way to manage your emotions, but because our creator is an amazing Lord and Father. And the people that I love, just like in Mary's life, are way better off in God's hands than mine. So if you're looking for joy, you don't need to look further than a God who took on our pain, our fear, and made a way for us to be complete 